Welcome to the Lock Sportscast, your weekly source for Lock Sport news and sometimes interviews. This is episode 78, recorded November 27th, 2021. I'm your host, Charles Current. In today's episode, a Guinness World Record first pick of the ABIS P12R, an excellent M Heart breakdown, the smallest challenge padlock, pack lock price increase, a bypass for Dodge Chrysler and Jeep vehicles, methods to prevent car thefts and break ins, bike theft in broad daylight, and more criminal news. Crazy locksmith story, sales giveaways, and more. You can subscribe to the audio version of the show on most podcast apps and at thelocksportscast.com. If you don't already have one, you can find a podcasting 2.0 compatible app at newpodcastapps.com. You can subscribe to the video version of the show on YouTube or Odyssey. Links to stories discussed will be in the show notes. YouTube and some apps limit the length of show notes, but you can always find full show notes with all of the links to the stories discussed at thelocksportscast.com. Quick reminder, Locky Award nominations start January 1st, so make sure you have all your lists of videos and people you want to nominate ready for January. First up in the news, Packlock sent out an email letting everybody know that they are going to have a price increase as of January 1st. They say, due to rising cost of materials, logistics, and labor, we are forced to increase our prices on January 1st, 2020. We will be raising our prices. We have made every effort to avoid this and did not come to this decision lightly. We recognize the impact this will have on our customers. So we wanted you to have the opportunity to make any purchases before the increase and take advantage of the great pack lock value at current prices. As always, we are committed to providing our customers with quality products and excellent service. Thank you for trusting a woman-owned family manufacturer employing veterans and people with disabilities. We appreciate your business and continued support. And then Tiger Trav from Australia wrote me a note this week. It reads, Hey mate, regarding the Dodge trucks with push-button start you mentioned being stolen, and the article you referenced about PIN code being required to add keys to the system, you suggested that it might be an exploit making them easier to steal over Fords and so forth. You are exactly correct on that. AutoPad Pro, as it is called in the US, or X-Tool, as it is called in the rest of the world, sells a connector called a brute force cable that bypasses all the security checks and PIN code requirements for adding additional keys to all Dodge, Ram, Jeep, and Chrysler made push button start cars made after 2018. Please feel free to share this demonstration video from Mikey's Automotive YouTube channel linked below. Even if the remote keyless function frequency is wrong, the generated key will start the car after being programmed by a programmer with a brute force cable. And then he provides link to this video on the Mikey's Automotive channel called 2018 plus Ram Dodge Jeep Chrysler bypass cable, how to read pin Program key, AutoPad Basic. Anyway, link to that in the show notes. It's an interesting device. Looks like they, they're only plugging two wires into a connector on the harness, not the OBD connector, but a, a separate connector that they say is located in different places on different vehicles. And only two wires are connected to it on the bypass cable. I don't know a whole lot about all this stuff, but I'm wondering if it isn't some sort of, if they're tapping into the CAN bus or whatever type of bus Dodge uses. Maybe Dodge only filters for certain CAN signals coming from the OBD port. And this is able to get around that because it's not accessing it through the official OBD port. Hard to say, but uh, the fact that they're calling it a bypass cable makes me think that there is something that's filtering signals from the OBD port that this is just able to go around because they didn't protect the rest of the, the wire harness. Anyway, definitely worth watching, especially if you own a uh, Ram Dodge Jeep Chrysler vehicle. And if you're worried about your vehicle being stolen, there is an article that was published called 10 Proven Anti-Theft Methods to Prevent Car Thefts and Break-Ins on Any Vehicle, published on Hot Cars, written by Wyatt Peterson. I'll just kind of go over the highlights of the things they list here, but they say saving your ride from theft doesn't have to be expensive. From research and tests, these are the most effective ways to prevent burglaries. There are around 740,000 car break-ins per year reported to the police. 
and almost as frequently 720,000 car thefts. That's three car crimes per minute in the U.S. alone. If you live in riskier cities, Bakersfield, Modesto, Albuquerque, Odessa, Honolulu, Denver, you have about a one in four odds of a break-in or theft during your average residence. Sadly, some super easy to steal cars like 90 Civics and Accords are just always going to be more prone, but you are not without hope. Here are 10 products and strategies to keep even your $100,000 sports car unstealable on the street. I don't know about that unstealable thing. But I will say that I've used a couple of these techniques when I had a 1990 Honda Accord. We drove that thing to California a few times, to uh, Nevada, Portland, Oregon, lots of different places, and I never had a break-in or a theft of the vehicle after using a couple of these techniques back, you know, in the early 2000s. So there is something to this because we saw these things stolen all the time when I worked at a Honda dealership. First on our list is Park in the Light. In an interview with 86 Burglars, KTVB found some very insightful statistics and methods that most property owners can apply to avoid break-ins, the most common theme being a risk of exposure and fear of lighting. One of the greatest deterrents, almost stupidly simple, is found to be a motion sensor light. Now again, I don't consider any of these to be foolproof. The whole point of these exercises is to compound these factors that they list here to to limit the likelihood that they will target your vehicle over, say, a neighbor's car or another car parked in the same parking lot. They're going to want one that has valuables or has value in the car itself and is easy to deal with. So number nine, cover or disguise valuables. Almost all break-ins happen when a criminal sees something valuable. If you must leave things in your car, put them in the trunk or even in the spare tire well. That is a trick I have used, that spare tire well thing. Number seven, the mysterious box. It can be as simple as a lockbox that looks official, normally a sign of a rental car with GPS or an otherwise tracked or theft-proof car. Now actually keeping your keys in it will add to the layers of protection and confusion if somehow they brave the unknown variable crack open the box and still want to get inside. So what they're talking about is like those little lock boxes that you see a car dealer put the keys to the car in that hangs on the vehicle's roll down window. I don't necessarily agree with that one, but it might work. Number six, steering wheel lock. These are not necessarily the most secure as most can be drilled through in a matter of minutes or pick. But just owning one means you slim down your potential burglars and yeah, it's one more layer that they would have to deal with, one more thing that would slow them down if they wanted to steal the car. I did use one of those in my Accord. Number five, nighttime blinking lights. When your car has a red or blue blinking light in it at night, it's usually from a running dash cam or other added security device. Like the black box trick, thieves just can't know what it's for and would much rather move along. That is also a trick I have used. And this one's a little strange cheaper car appearance. You might want to consider owning a sleeper car. A trick we learned while researching this was to remove your front bumper. This is a temporary extreme measure for nice cars in sketchy areas, but effective. Yeah, I don't know that I'd go that far. Number three, warning sticker. A lot of vehicles come with or have warning stickers, and while this is closer to a 50-50 chance of preventing break-ins, the threat of a GPS tracking system is one of the most surefire ways to scare a thief. Number two, a kill switch. The kill switch is an unbeatable device, debatable, that even people who have driven in your car with you might not be able to detect or replicate. It's quite simply a typical button or a switch tapped into your ignition wires. Look up the proper way to do it on your own vehicle. That costs $5 or less at your local hardware store. The smaller and more discreet, the better. And number one they list is a GPS. A GPS in modern times can be as small as a quarter and run for months on one battery. In the case of a car, they don't need to be accurate and it can be mounted anywhere a thief won't check. And they do check. Alternatively, you can keep the little keychain trackers known as tiles in your backpack or valuables which don't have GPS, but will alert you if it comes close to certain Bluetooth devices, giving you some hope in decently populated areas. 
Anyway, those are just some tips to add layers of security to your vehicle security plan, especially if you have one of the vehicles that is highly likely to be targeted. Again, the idea is not that these are going to prevent a theft necessarily, but the idea is to make your vehicle less appealing, more uh, risk versus reward calculation going on there. Make your vehicle less appealing than the car parked next to it. Thieves are going to break in. The thieves are going to steal stuff out of cars. Thieves are going to steal cars. You want them to do it to somebody else's. So the idea is to just make yours that much more difficult, that much less interesting, so they go for somebody else's. Moving on to community news. This week, Coxie Picks put out a video called Guinness World Record Most Handcuffs Unlocked in One Minute. And there's a note, this is still awaiting official verification, but the most handcuffs unlocked in one minute is now 10. It was filmed in a public place with specialist witnesses. And this video he posts is the actual session for the timing. It's very impressive. Uh, one minute and he unlocks 10 pairs of handcuffs completely from both wrists, dropping them on the floor as he gets them off. Very, very fast. Very impressive. Yeah, you should really watch it. I will have a link in the show notes. And congratulations to you, Coxie Picks. I can't see any reason from watching your video why they wouldn't verify the results. So congratulations to you. And we have what appears to be the first public pick of the ABIS P12R by Gravity Karma. Uh, his video is linked in the show notes if you want to check it out. Congratulations, Gravity Karma. Very well done. And Panda Frog put out a video called Lock Picking, and I'm not even going to try to pronounce the name of it, but the smallest challenge padlock. He created a challenge lock out of a tiny three pin padlock. This thing is barely big enough to get a pick and a tension wrench into, let alone pick, but uh, he managed to create a challenge lock out of it, so good to go. Uh, at this point, it is the smallest that we know of. If you know of one smaller, please, please let me know. And moving on to the video section, a video you really need to watch is by Artichoke2000, Mhart High Security Picked and Deconstructed. This video just went live this weekend, and he doesn't excellent job of explaining the mechanisms, breaking down how the M heart works, and a very, very simplified explanation of how to pick at least one of the key ways that, uh, that exists. Because as he points out, there are different methods for picking different key ways because they give you different access to the pins. And since you have to rotate the pins, that can affect the way you have to pick it quite a bit but he does demonstrate a very smooth method for picking the M heart with the keyway he has access to. I really recommend you go check it out and the link will be in the show notes. And this next video is just shocking to me. Uh, it kind of blows out everything we just learned about preventing theft in the article I read earlier. It's called Bike Theft in Broad Daylight. The description says happened in front of Surrey K's shopping center on November 6th. I'm not sure exactly where that is, but this guy walks up recording with his phone to two guys. One of them is standing by with the scooter. The other is actively cutting the bike lock off of this expensive looking electric bike with a cordless angle grinder in broad daylight in front of the shopping center, people standing around and they cut it loose and he even asks him if it's his bike and the guy just looks at him and goes back to cutting and they cut it loose and they take off <laughs> brazen what are you gonna do broad daylight crime becomes a lot easier when you can walk around with your face covered without looking suspicious moving on to products if you remember back in episode 76 i think it was we discussed a post by lock noob showing off a new card he was working with Sparrow's lock picks on that appeared to contain padlock shims and a few other things on the card. And he has put out a video called Shimmy Card from Sparrow's Lock Picks. It says, does this work? Is it fun and original? Yes. Is there room for improvement? 
Also, yes, let me know your thoughts on this cool co-designed project between Sparrow's Lockpicks and myself. It's an interesting little card with very thin metal and made with appears to be either laser or water cut shims, uh, padlock shims of a couple of different sizes and a handcuff shim and a few other shims located on this card that you can just carry around in your wallet. Anyway, you can check that out over on Lock Noob's channel if you're interested. And Cheryl sent in a note here, said, Hey Charles, on tonight's CLK Supplies live video, they had a guest on who's a locksmith who recently launched a lock-themed store at lockjawmfg.com. Here's to be a whole site of lock-themed artwork and apparel. You might want to check it out, see if any of it is your style. It's a lot of the, uh, as Trell says, Ed Hardy-ish, or I would describe a lot of that, you know, tattoo artist style art, but in lock form. You might want to go check it out. The link will be in the show notes, but it is lockjawmfg.com. All one word, lockjawmfg. And on to the Lockpickers United belts this week. We have one new brown belt. I am noob ABC earned a brown belt. And for red belts, we have Dromosite and Spoon, both with their red belts. Congratulations to all of you. Very well done. And keep up the great work. For Speedlocks records this week, we have a first record for the EVA 3KS by Plaz7 in 4 minutes 20.8. 867 seconds. We have a new first record for the CASP 12515 by Pandafrog in 0.834 seconds. We have a new first record for the Lockwood 12040 by Gilligans in 2.419 seconds. So you can head over to their Discord and congratulate them on their new speed records. Also, the Speedlocks Tournament of Champions has a winner. The first Tournament of Champions winner is Sir Paradise. So congratulations, Sir Paradise. Not surprising with the times he was putting out. Pandafrog says they also did a drawing for four bonus prizes and posted the video on their new Speedlocks YouTube channel. So please be kind and subscribe to that channel. Link will be in the show notes to the video on that channel. Head over there and check it out and consider subscribing. Now it's time to take a quick break. Say thank you to people that made this episode possible. I'd like to say thank you to uh, my latest Patreon subscriber. I have a level on Patreon that does not get credits on the show. I do that partly so people can subscribe if they want to be anonymous, but also it's just a way to limit the number of people that I have to thank on the show. But I do want to say thank you for signing up. I really do appreciate it. And it really means a lot to me when anybody signs up. So thank you very much. And with that, the producers of this episode include the Patreon subscribers. We have Panda Frog, Michael Gilchrist, Starlock, Williams Brain, Dave 2 bd Seifert, Lee Bonds Locksport Journey, Pat from Uncensored Tactical, Three Raccoons in a Coat, Cherelle, Patty Cakes, Dr. Hogmaster, Clayton Howard, aka Cool Tune, Mog, John Locke, Rat Yoke, Mr. Picker, Cranky Lock Picker, Real Tater, JHP Picking, Chief content producers for this episode is a tie again. This one between iFisk and Pandafrog. Pandafrog really stepped up this week and sent in a lot of stuff, so thank you for that. I really do appreciate it. Other content producers for this episode are Artichoke2000, Cherell, Froggy Picker, Gilly Gaines, Gumby, HV Logic, John Locke, Joshua Gonzalez, Real Tater, Tequila Dave, Tiger Trav from Australia, and Tony Varelli. Thank you to all of you for the information and monetary support. I really do appreciate it. Remember, this show is only possible because of the information and support from the community. So if you value this podcast, please help support it. The number one way you can do that is by sending in your news, links, events, giveaway information, anything you have that's Locksport related that you think the rest of the community might want to know about. You can send it to me at podcast at thelocksportscast.com or any of the other methods listed at thelocksportscast.com slash support. Other things you can do are share the podcast with your lockpicking friends, either online or in person. I would really appreciate it. More people that are listening, the more people there are to potentially send in news. It's always helpful if you leave a review on your favorite podcast platform or a comment and thumbs up on YouTube or Odyssey. 
You can always subscribe to the audio podcast and or the YouTube and Odyssey channels. If you want to support financially, you can donate via PayPal or subscribe on Patreon. Patreon subscribers get a private RSS feed that gives them the audio version about a day early. That's really the only benefit they get other than knowing that they're helping keeping me motivated to keep producing the show. If you support the show with a donation or information that I use in the show, I will give you credit in the show and on the show notes. So there's that. It's not much, but it's something. If you have any interesting stories about your journey through Locksport, either doors it's opened, doors it's closed, things that have happened to you because of your interest in Locksport, or just an interesting way you've progressed through the belts or something, uh, send it in. I'm looking for more people's stories of their Locksport journey. So you can send it to me at podcast at locksportscast.com. Remember to keep the Locky Awards in mind as we come to the end of the year. Start making your lists of who you want to nominate. And we'll get that process started at the beginning of the new year. If you'd like to send feedback, you can go to locksportscast.com slash contact. There's a form there, or there's also all the different ways to contact me listed there. Feedback can be kept confidential, or I can share it on the show. That's your choice. If you want to share it on the show, you're welcome to submit it as a note, video, or audio recording. Just remember to keep it reasonable length, polite, work family safe, no politics, and no drama. Moving on to the strange locksmith story for this week. We have a story here out of Kamloops, British Columbia. I'm probably going to butcher this name, but it's Dalawal sues business rival. Ex-city councillor suing rival locksmith alleging fake bad reviews and lies to local MLA. Story says a former city councillor and Kamloops businessman is suing a rival company alleging its workers posted fake and disparaging reviews online and tried to spread lies about his business to politicians in Victoria. Ray Dalawal, who served on the city council between 2016 and 2018, owns Ray's Lock and Key and Brown's Repair Shop, each of which provide locksmith services. In a filing with the BC Supreme Court last week, Dalawal accused rival interior locksmith of playing dirty in a number of ways. He said that an alleged interior locksmith employee posted a false negative review on Google last December. The review read, This guy is a crook. His business has been shut down by the government and he still runs and advertises it. I hope someone runs him out of town soon. According to the lawsuit, interior locksmith employees and representatives maliciously and without just cause or excuse, published disparaging comments about the plaintiffs in the form of numerous one-star negative Google reviews late last year. The filing also alleges that around the same time last year, Interior Locksmith representatives contacted the local MLA and made false and or misleading statements to the MLA about the plaintiffs' companies and said they were operating illegally. The document also accuses Interior Locksmith of passing itself off as Dalawal's companies, pointing to alleged Google ads that lump the competitors together, as well as the fact that meta-tagging has created confusing results for anyone trying to find his companies on Google. He also is asking the judge to place an injunction preventing Interior Locksmith from publishing disparaging comments about the plaintiffs and making false statements about his companies and causing confusion among those looking for locksmiths in the area. He wants the negative reviews deleted and problematic Google ads removed. In addition, he wants Interior Locksmith to change its website URL. The current URL is camloopslocksmith.ca, nearly identical to his camloopslocksmith.com, because it would violate the proposed injunction by confusing would-be customers. So it sounds like they have quite the rivalry going on there in Kamloops, B.C. But one thing to keep in mind is that these are just accusations at this point. Until there is something played out in court, we can't say for sure whether these are accurate allegations. And out of Lexington, South Carolina, the Lexington Ledger, the headline is Lexington business owners ask public to get involved after recent burglary. The article says that sometime between closing time Thursday night and opening on Friday, 
Several people broke into the Tropical Grill and Marcos Plaza, which are located side by side in a strip center. The perpetrators commando crawled across the floor of the business, broke into their safes, and made off with what little there was to steal. The two suspects then made their escape out a door undetected. According to the owner of the Tropical Grill, several other Marcos pizzas in the Lexington County jurisdictions were hit in the exact same way on the same night, according to information he's received. He said the suspects didn't bother anything else in the restaurants and seemed to have gone straight for the safes as if they knew right where they were. He also says that he never leaves anything of value in the safe overnight, and because of that habit, He didn't really lose anything of value, and insurance will cover the damages they did to the store and the safe. Lexington Police Department responded to the burglaries and have assigned an investigator to work the cases. There is a good quality surveillance video of the thieves in action, but because of the way they crawled, you can't see their faces. They each had on hoodies and wore gloves as they committed the crime. They also both appear to be young men, although that's not a certainty. According to the business owner, as of Friday afternoon, no one had been taken into custody. The owner is asking that the public look at the pictures and videos to see if they can help the police to crack this safe cracking case. So I will have a link to those videos in the show notes. They're quite entertaining as these guys really do commando crawl around. It's hard to say why they're doing that for sure, whether it's to hide themselves from the camera hide themselves from or attempt to hide themselves from motion sensors or maybe just to keep themselves below the level of the windows so that they can't be seen by people outside. Hard to say, but they are crawling around sometimes on all fours, sometimes complete like low crawl, commando crawl type. So what happens when the police do confront a criminal? Well, here we have an article called Mountain Lake Terrace Man Arrested after attempting to flee in a patrol vehicle. This is by K-I-R-O-7. Story says that around 1.45 a.m., deputies were responding to a call of an assault with weapon at a gas station in Everett. Deputies learned that there were two men fighting. One was armed with a knife and a screwdriver. That man threw down the knife, but refused to drop the screwdriver. As the man walked away, he quickly turned back towards the gas station parking lot and picked up his pace. As the deputy and canine neared the vehicle, the car sensed his key fob unlocking the driver's door. The man quickly jumped into the driver's seat, but the deputy quickly pulled open the door and ordered his canine inside. As the canine jumped inside and bit the man's arm, he put the car in drive and stepped on the gas. A safety feature prevented the car from driving off, and after a struggle, the deputy and canine removed the man from the car. When backup units arrived, the man continued to fight with deputies, but was eventually taken into custody. 33-year-old man was transported to hospital for treatment and then booked into the county jail for felony harassment, resisting arrest, vehicle theft, and a previous case of indecent exposure. Sounds like quite the winner, but this does highlight an interesting problem with these proximity fobs in that he was able to get into the car and put it into gear. It's interesting. And then if the police manage to arrest the suspect, they have to keep him in custody. This next story is murder suspect breaks handcuffs, makes great escape. This one is out of Las Vegas. North Las Vegas police released footage on Wednesday of a Nevada murder suspect breaking a pair of handcuffs before using a chair to climb through the roof and escape a police interview room, according to the Associated Press. Technically, he didn't climb through the roof, he climbed through the ceiling. There's a difference. The suspect is seen in the video handcuffed to the table. The clip starts off with the suspect looking around the room, his eyes repeatedly going towards the ceiling. He then stands up, starts twisting and applying pressure to the handcuffs, which are attached to a metal bar on a table that is bolted to the floor. According to the police chief, The suspect was able to apply enough torque with the help of his body weight to finally snap the hinges on the cuffs. After getting loose, the suspect is then seen calmly returning to his seat as if nothing happened with his hand over the metal bar when a police detective looks in on him. After the detective leaves, he uses a chair to remove a ceiling tile 
it's a suspended ceiling. So he removes the ceiling tile and then eventually climbs into the ceiling and out of the interrogation room. He then dropped down into a hallway and left the building before going on to jack a work truck that was left running in a nearby parking lot. According to the chief, it was another 25 minutes before the cops realized he was gone. According to the police, he was arrested three days after his escape without further incident. He is accused of fatally shooting another gentleman in a McDonald's parking lot in August. Police putting a little too much confidence in the physical restraints and not enough uh, attention paid to actually monitoring the suspect here. Because it's quite obvious what he's doing if they were watching the video from maybe a surveillance screen outside. Maybe they should have something to where they can see that stuff. Just because somebody's locked in a room doesn't mean they can't get out. One thing that a lot of people seem to forget is that drop ceilings are vulnerable. Walls are not impenetrable. Just because there appears to be a physical barrier there doesn't mean it's an adequate physical barrier and somebody who is motivated enough can likely find a way out. Anyway, link in the show notes if you want to watch this video of how he breaks these cuffs. It's hard to see exactly what he does, but you can tell he's twisting and twisting pretty hard until it snaps. So moving on to sales, this I was a little perplexed about how I was going to deal with this whole sales thing this week because Black Friday was yesterday as I'm recording this and Cyber Monday is a couple of days out here, but that's the day this video will release for most of you. So most of these sales that are out there are going to be over by the time most of you hear this. But if you go to the locksportscast.com slash news or go to locksportscast.com and click on the, the menu item for news, it will take you to the news page. And there are three links on the top of that news page. One of them is sales. If you click on that, it will list all of the sales that I currently know about. So if you are hearing this in time, you can go over there and check out those. You can also hit the discords for any that may have come up that I didn't catch. But looking at it here, we have, I'll mention a few of them that are lasting for a long time here. So we have over at Dark Arts Lock Picking, dalp.com.au. We have 20% off with the code Grinchmas21. That is lasting until the 31st of December. Over at uklockpickers.co.uk, they have a code UKLP Black Friday for 15% off everything. And that lasts from Black Friday to Cyber Monday. So if you jump on it, you might get to use that. Peterson Locksmith Tools has one code remaining. They put out several, but there's one remaining that expires on December 20th for 15% off. Southord has their annual Christmas sale that expires December 21st at southord.com. 25% discount on all products with the code SANTA25. Keydecoder.eu. Discounted prices on their website, no code. The sale ends at the end of 2021, they say. We have the usual codes for 3dlocksport.com. LSCAS10 will save you 10%. And another code here for uklockpickers.co.uk for 10% off with the code GIFT. So if you missed the earlier one, you can still use that one. Mako Locks, the code by Mako for 15% off. Matt's Lock Pit still appears to be having a sale. As far as Black Friday sales, there are links in this list for Multipick, Lockpick Shop, Southern Specialties, Covert Instruments, 3D Locksport, Law Lock Tools, Lockpick World, Red Team Tools, Sparrows Lockpicks, and Bump Key Co. And then uh, also on here are the sales for the closeout of hydrometer picks from Peterson Locksmith Tools have been saying for weeks, and the Surplus sale up to 50% off at masterlock.com. Neither one of those have an expiration date, so we'll just have to watch and see. Anyway, the locksportscast.com slash news, click on sales, and you can find all those. I've got the codes if they apply in there, as well as what the discount is, and a link to where you can use the code. Moving on to giveaways. Panda Frog shared a giveaway by uh, Vent or Zfix. The master. Big Lockmaster Lockpick Set Giveaway is being held on Gleam.io. 
It says two winners will receive a 3250E-L Master Pick Set. The lock picks all with blue handles, the extractors all with black handles, as well as tension wrenches. Terms and conditions. Uh, address, no PO box in a country that DHL Express is able to ship to, must be 18 or older. It has to be legal for you to own opening tools in your area. And you have to agree to allow them to contact you to get an address if you win, and you will have 48 hours to answer before a new winner is selected. Looks like that one ends sometime around December 5th. All it said was this morning was uh, nine days left. So I did a rough calculation somewhere around December 5th. Also, Panda Frog in his English video 236 says that he is going to be running a giveaway in conjunction with the Loco Month from speedlocks.org for the month of December. So starting on December 1st, if you join in in the Loco Month contest that they have, where it's going to be on a single pin pickable TSA lock this month, uh, he will be throwing in some prizes for one of the people that in a random draw for one of the people that enters that. So be sure to get in on that. John Locke has his 300 subscriber giveaway running till November 30th. So be sure to check that out while time is still available. There's also still time for Panda Frog's Speed Abyss giveaway, which he announced in his English 232 video, I think here. That one also ends on November 30th. Link in the show notes like all of these. If you still want to get in on that before the time runs out, Froggy Picker, one year giveaway, hashtag one year Froggy. You have until November 30th to enter that one. So last chance on several of these. And right after those finish will be a chance to get in on the Laco Month one from Panda Frog. So be sure to check those out. Also, there's always CLK Supplies. They do a weekly giveaway. And they are a locksmith supply shop, so they have lots of good stuff to give away. Lots of people enjoy that one, so I just keep putting it on here. Remember, this show needs your support, so please send in any information you have that's locksport related, whether it's news, valuable information, just entertaining stories or information. Send it to podcast at the locksportscast.com or go to locksportscast.com slash support to find all the different ways to help out and support the show. I really appreciate you guys very, very much. So please remember, stay out of trouble and keep it legal. Legal.